capitalism and everything else. We're going to talk about Dan's latest book. He just finished two hours ago, and it is all about capitalism. And one of the big things that I got out of it today is I said, Dan, I think kids need to be reading this book. And Dan goes over capitalism's five measurements. These are really big ideas. As usual, they're really nuanced. They'll sound like simple words you've thought of before, but when you hear it in the context that Dan shares, I can guarantee you you're going to have some big ahas today. Dan, how about you? What were some of your big takeaways? Well, I think the big thing, you're the first person outside of the project team who's actually gotten any um, news on this. And um, uh, I'm happy, first of all, that we got the whole thing finished, like conceptually the whole thing's finished, and it's in the hands of my team now who fine-tune it and package it and then produce the final book. But uh, I've just had a sense that there's a lot of silliness and nonsense uh, being spoken uh, in, a, uh, in the age of rage <laughs> that we're living in that's being magnified by the Age of Rages uh, platform called social media about capitalism. And uh, um, the what really strikes me is that people who sound very profound about this haven't the foggiest idea what they're talking about. And being a coach of entrepreneurs for close to 50 years, uh, they, they just have no inkling of what's actually involved in true capitalism. All right. Well, I uh, I really enjoyed this episode. I know you will, too. So tune in, whether you're watching it on our YouTube channel or you are listening. And uh, by the time you're done, let us know what you think about getting this book and also sharing it with young people. So all that and more of this episode of Capability Amplifier. Everyone, uh, Dan Sullivan here, and I'm here with uh, Mike Koenigs, and Mike is enjoying tropical luxury. I guess uh, this is the west coast of the Baja Peninsula. He's halfway down, about halfway down, right from the border to um, to the tip to Cabo. Further, just yeah, we're about an hour away from Cabo in yeah. beautiful Pescadero where we- Right on the, right on the Pacific, we could, uh, he showed us the camera looking outside and we could see the, or just see where the beach was and, um, you know, and he, he's um, uh, tending to his uh, tequila crops and, uh, you know, and he's got his little robot submarine that ships the <laughs> Uh, the strong stuff back up, up above San Diego where it gets picked up by local representatives and everything. He's just having a wonderful time. We're smuggling, smuggling like crazy down here. That's the job. There's no <laughs> smugglers blues in uh, Pescadero, Mexico. No doubt about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you've been getting sun. I can see that you've been in the sun. And uh, the, the my my tan, I, I actually, I, I'm pretty tan for midwinter in Toronto, but this is just my aversion to um, um, con Canadian conformity. So I, I'm just uh, differentiating myself from the thing. But we've had a very, I mean, we, we had the storm of storms, but we didn't get the storm. Buffalo got the storm and, uh, yeah. and uh, but we got maybe six inches and, you know, it, shut some things down, some power went out, but nothing nothing that you don't deserve by choosing to live in Canada. Right, right. We're down here right now. It's 80 degrees. The water's incredibly warm, and um, even even San Diego's too cold for me right now. Well, the Pacific is a cold ocean. It is. It is. It's, it's, now, it's, a, very, it's, a, it's a very cold ocean. You know, I mean, we go... Yeah, you know, we go wading at uh, Santa Monica, and it's really ch it's really chilly in Santa Monica, and nobody's surfing there without uh, suits. You know, there nobody nobody. That Alaska stream coming down—that's what gets you versus what comes uh, from up here. But uh, yeah, yeah. Well, and Mike, did Mexico ever play a part in your um, plans? I mean, yeah, uh, I guess it certainly wouldn't have until you moved 
close to the border, but uh, when did Mexico, and especially where you've chosen to park yourself, where, when, when did that show up? Well, what happened, um, we, when we first moved to San Diego, one of our very first clients was located across the border in Rosarito, so it's just a little bit south of Tijuana. It was one of the first integrative functional medi- medicine hospitals in the world called Sanaviv. And they were doing all sorts of alternative therapies that at the time weren't licensable in the States. And this was started by an American billionaire named Dr. Myron Wentz, who started the USANA Medical Sciences. And they hired us to do their marketing. And interestingly, I actually designed and created Traffic Geyser as a result of a, a need for that. So, but the answer to your question was we started crossing over and we just fell in love with the people and the culture. And it felt so strange that you could drive across a border and literally be in a very, very different country, you know, a half an hour away. It just was like, hard for my Midwestern brain to get around. And then um, a couple of years ago, Vivian was down here visiting right in this area, a guy named Chip Conley, who started something called MEA. Yeah. And um, she just called me up and said, I want to move here. And uh, one thing I know about my wife is I just say, yes, honey, that's a great idea. Yeah. And we came down and we it was like, what a paradise. And uh, like every three or four months now, this place is really developing. Um, most of the property has gone and it is very nice, high-end luxury. But you have... It feels like old West America yeah. in, a, in a weird way. It feels like there's cowboys down here, and there are. There's real cowboys and uh, a lot of farming. It's but- probably, uh, probably the coast south of Los Angeles in the 1940s or 50s. Exactly. That's, yeah. what, that's what it feels like. Except warmer. Except warmer. It is. It is. It's much more temperate. And um, because on the Pacific side, you don't have the humidity. Um, that you would on the other side, which is only an hour away to La Paz, which is the capital city of Baja. But it is, um, uh, you know, Mexico has become very Americanized in most of the best ways, you know, some of the bad ways as well. But, um, you know, the labor is great down here. The food's amazing. Um, we're on water, even though it's very desert, deserty. Um, so I think it's it all comes down to an incredible quality of life. Um, you don't have you have different kinds of regulations, but it doesn't feel overregulated in an American sense. And um, the expats who live down here live here on purpose. Mm-hmm. And there's an enormous amount of entrepreneurial activity. So the vision we've always had is let's bring the best of what we have. And in a place that is beautiful year round and um, create as much abundance. You know, I, I think of it to my, this is a free zone experiment. That's really yeah. what I've, I've yeah. been envisioning is, is a great way to create a little free zone town mm-hmm. yeah, um, with that mindset. Yeah. Yeah. And now, just for my uh, geographic edification here, when you go up the east side of the Baja, you'll get up to the top of the Sea of Cortez. Okay. What's the distance right there to the U.S. border when you cross? Because there's a little bit that you can cross over to the main part of Mexico right at the top. Yes. So um, I'll just give you a sense of like from San Diego to drive to Cabo is about 22, 20 to 24 hours. Okay. And there's gas and services and it's can get a little rumbly on the way. You know, it's, it's, um, the highways have improved dramatically, but there's still some Baja-esque elements to it. And then if you start going up the other um, side of the coast, it's sort of like, think of it as just like the uh, Florida Panhandle. So um, when you go up that side, um, eventually you're going to be underneath, I guess, like Texas, Arizona, and that kind of thing. Um but I don't know how many miles it is to get across. I have to look at yeah. that. Yeah. And not uh, I'm not looking at the map here. Specialty. But but now I have to look at the map because um I've unloosed a question in my brain and yeah. it just bothers me until I answer it. Um 
Nothing yeah. better than being around OCD folks. I love I love people like you, Dean. No, I'm not OCD. Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, I'm, just, I'm, uh, I've been called many things. I've never been called that. Anyway, but I just uh, wrapped up another quarterly book uh, today, uh, the interview part of it. So what I do is I do a mindset scorecard, and I get the entire mindset um you know, landscape all worked out. And then I, um, and uh, this is a tempter to people who don't know what I'm talking about to um, pay us ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000, and we'll show you what we're talking about here. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> um, and this one is called Capitalism Dash and Everything Else. And uh, I think I have actually succeeded in giving an entirely new definition and explanation of capitalism. Mm. Um, you know, it's a short book. All my books are really short. Uh, but uh, uh, it's re really, really interesting because uh, a lot of my indicators that I'm on to something unique is the team members who've never, they, they always see, Capitalism is capital C, you know, uh, you know, oh, yeah. and everything else. But uh, what I make the statement here is that capitalism is the only system that actually starts with the unique individualism of people. That uh, the whole starting, the spring that flows, and the starting spring for all capitalism really starts with unique individualism. And then it's a growth path that you go through, a five-stage growth path. And um, and this has been going for as long as there's been human beings. And uh, But the conditions have gotten better and better for people to actually make the capitalist methodology um, the basis for their life. And in, in, in choosing to be an entrepreneur, I think you're being the purest form of capitalism. And uh, so I link it up with entrepreneurism at the end. But I said, this has been going on for as long as human beings considered themselves different from other species. And this is the way we make our way in life through this methodology. It's not an ideology, it's a methodology. Yeah. So the reason I wrote it was a little bit of irritation with the public discussion about um, that there's like an ideology shopping mall and you go and there's the socialism store and there's the communism store and the fascism store and, you know, any other kind of store. And then there's the old capitalist store, you know, and somehow there's an equivalency between these words. I said, there's no, uh, those are ideologies. Capitalism is a methodology. Okay, it's not about what you believe, it's how you do things and get things done. Okay, mm. and if you scratch the really successful communist and, you know, and got them alone and had to see how they made their way through life, they, they probably followed capitalist principle, capitalist growth things to get where they were, you know. And, um, but, um, it's the only one that rewards unique individualism. It's the only system that, and uh, the, the more unique and the more individual you are, the the bigger the rewards. So that's, and I got that done today. It was very satisfying because it's been on my mind for 50 years. And um, and I um, finally put it down on paper. I love it. So what's, uh, tell me the title of the book. Capitalism, yep. Dash, and Everything Else. Okay. And Everything Else Doesn't Work. Yeah. <laughs> I could have said capitalism and the other shit. <laughs> yeah, so so anyway, uh, but it was deeply satisfying because uh, my team members, and I have nine other team members on my writing team who produce the various parts of the book, and um, they all said, this is, I just never thought about it this way. And that, that's great enjoyment for me to create something where somebody said, you know, I've just never thought about it this way. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, I, I think 
you know, this is always what you're best at, which is um, reframing what appears to be a simple idea and unmasking the fact that it's actually incredibly complicated and complex with a ton of nuance and a simple shift in consciousness can just change your life. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll give you a real life example. Cause right before we got on, I was onboarding a, a new client who's in the world of HR efficiency and that kind of thing, which historically I'd, I'd run from that kind of activity, but I love this guy's mindset. And, um, he's also, uh, a big fan of yours and, uh, his name is, uh, Brian Howard mm. and he's been around, um, strategic coach thinking, but I gave him an assignment and he went out and he read, um, who do you want to be a hero to? And cause I used that phrase, I, I asked him specifically, you know, I want you to describe your perfect audience, your perfect customer, who you want to be a hero to. And also I want you to go out and ask your best customers, what do they say about you? Um, what, who do they think you are? What values do they perceive you have? And there was enormous consistency, which is one of the things I always look for. But, um, I think the way it pertains to this is I think if you can get this message in front of right fit people, um, you can genuinely change the way they think for the rest of their lives. And the earlier you get to them, the better mm -hmm. the question I would have for you, Dan would be, um, what's the youngest age you think this book could get in front of and how could that affect them or society 10 or 20 or 30 years from now? Yeah. <clears throat> well, you know, before I started uh, writing the quarterly books, I would say, you know, probably teens, late teens, you could probably get them late teens. Mm -hmm. But what we noticed since we used a cartoon approach for our books, um, so all of our, uh, half the space of our books is actually cartoons. You know, that, uh, so each chapter has, you know, it's a short um, four-page chapter, and uh, uh, that's the text. And then there's, uh, uh, there's eight chapters. There's an intro, which is another section. There's a conclusion. So there's 10 sections, and then we have a strategic coach uh, overview, you know, of, um, you know, that the idea being explained in the book is, uh, mainline stuff in strategic coach and but that's all cartooned and what we discovered I mean we weren't trying to do this but the moment that the strategic coach entrepreneurs who all receive a quarterly book as part of their membership uh, they take it home they're one of their children who are and uh, and I'm going to zero in right now I'm, I'm going to change my answer that how soon as I think seven or eight years old, okay. seven or eight years old, they should be at a reading age. You know, they can, they can read, but then the, um, often what happens is that the entrepreneur's son or daughter will say, can you walk through the cartoons with me and explain what the cartoons mean? And the, so the, Entrepreneur will do a real quick read of the book and then go through and explain the whole thing. And they ask all sorts of questions. So my sense is that probably seven or eight. Great. Because you remember um, the books. Um, the first one I, I read was Whatever Happened to Penny Candy. Um, and it's it's all about capitalism and it's an Uncle Eric book. Do you remember the, all those? No, I don't. No. Okay, I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a game changer here because, and that's why I asked you about the age. So I'm going to show this on screen. There's a whole series of what are called Uncle Eric books. Oh. And one of them's called Whatever Happened to Penny Candy, a fast, clear, and fun explanation of the economics you need for success in your career, business, and investments. And it's all about inflation and how countries steal money. Mm -hmm. And... Um, 
uh, some of his other books, and there's a whole bunch. The real author, his name is Richard Mayberry. Mm-hmm. And, um, like, here's one failure of global socialist experiment. Um, uh, the Fed caused disaster. Time to bail out. What to do with your money? Um, these are new ones, but here's one called Whatever Happened to Justice? Mm-hmm. Um, the Money Mystery, The Hidden Force, uh, The Clipper Ship Strategy. Um, this one I loved. There's another one, World War II. I can't believe I haven't talked to you about these books or we it hadn't come up, Dan. You'd love them. So yeah, the- I would. I would read them. Richard Mayberry. Uh, was a, I think he's a, like a high school or, or middle school ep- economics teacher, something like that. Here's the thousand year war in the Middle East. Okay. It explains how the powers that be have divided countries to create confusion and create lines and, and why the politics ancient Rome and how it affects you today. It gets into the history of ancient Rome, what we share with it. Here's World War II, why war, or World War I. But anyway, they're so good and easy reading. They're made for young people. Yeah. But I think you will find when you read them that you share a lot in common with the mindset because this guy is a died all historically focused capitalist who really, really sees with clarity society through – um, for sure, the last thousand years, mm-hmm. and uh, well, it's really um, you know the roots of uh, uh, capitalism as we understand it today really go back, um, and it's Northern Europe actually. It's uh, more than anything. It's um, um, the Germanic countries. You know what you would say, you know Germany and Low Countries. And those are the people who were not conquered by the Romans, okay? Mm-hmm. Okay, and they were tribal. And uh, mm-hmm. actually, the greatest uh, defeat that the Roman Empire ever um, ever encountered was in a forest called Tut- Tutoburg Forest, and that's uh, uh, you know it's in Germany right now. It's near the Rhine River, and uh, uh, a legion. Uh, Three legions, uh, I think it's the 17th, 18th, and 19th legion. So the Romans had 20 legions. They each had um, you know, 2,000, two, 3,000 legionnaires. And um, then they'd pick up um, allies along the, along the way who would do a lot of the grunt work. And, uh, uh, but um, um, one of the people who was in the legion had been captured at uh, in childhood stage, and he had been taken to Rome, and he was raised as a Roman yeah. and uh, by a wealthy family. And he um, um, watched how the Romans did things, and um, but with the thing in mind that he was going to bring all the knowledge of Rome back to the German tribes, and they were going to defeat the Romans. And he did it when he was 25 years old. Which was an older twenty-five than today. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. You you were just short of pension when you were twenty-five in those days, you know. Yeah. And anyway, he uh, he loved them, and he had them all. He had the tribes all prepared for them, and he loved them. And they had a guy who was the general, who was a general only because of his political connections. He wasn't a real general, and uh, and he was kind of cruel and he was greedy and he was avaricious and he was out to prove that he could run a legion and um, and he they snuckered them into a part of the forest and they killed 6,000 of them. They killed every single Roman, okay? And they nailed their heads to the tree and everything else. And uh, the bones just sat there for two or three years you know, they got picked dry. They took all the armor. They took everything that was of use, the weapons and everything, the Germanic tribes. And then a um, very famous, he was actually famous Roman general when Germanicus went. And he had every bone buried. They, 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 they uh, created mass graves and they 
had every bone and so that there was no more remains. But it just shook, the, and that was the furthest the Romans went. They, they never went any further uh, after that battle. They had, um, they had kind of extended themselves too far, uh, and they were getting kind of arrogant and complacent. And, and so the whole point, that whole northern part of Germany was never conquered by the Romans. And that's where the first, you get the first stages of tribes uh, developing real private ownership of land. You get uh, um, uh, assemblies that actually had a, a democratic basis and everything else. And that, all of that really moved to Great Britain and moved to the low countries of Holland and moved move to it. And that, that's about, you know, and this was in the year seven, so... Um, those tribes, you know, um, developed along the way. And uh, the democracy as we know it from today does not come from Greece. It comes from Northern Europe, especially property laws, the whole thing about property laws and how important property is and everything else. And then, you know, the UK, uh, what we call the UK, was just enormous numbers of tribes battling with each other. So anyway, it's a very, very interesting thing. So I think his last thousand years is a very, very good starting point because that's about how long, um, you know, the model that we're work working with right now really goes back about a thousand years. Okay, so let, let me ask you this. Right, I have a question. How did you meet this man? Get more clients, grow your business with better marketing and messaging. Make more money and get a better life with more freedom of time, money, relationship, and impact. Learn more about our three-day, one-on-one, done-with-you reinvention workshop. Visit connecttomike.com to book a conversation with me right now. All right, back to the episode. Um, so I originally found out about the book. It was someone in Genius Network. And I, I got whatever happened to Penny Candy, and then I read it every single book i ordered all of them i can't remember there's probably like 12 or 16 in the series and i immediately just became a huge fan because i love the clarity that he's spoken you know you don't feel like you'd be spoken down to as a kid or as an adult but it's really written um for maximum clarity and they're very very thin books they're like your books they're you know 40 pages, 40, 50 pages, yeah. yeah. These are a little bit more than that, but I mean, it's, it's, they're short, concise, to the point. And uh, again, I think what I love is the values you'd share, which, which uh, my next question to you, Dan, is inside the capitalism book, what are the eight mindsets that you decided on? Because that really dictates the mm -hmm. value. Um, can you describe what they yeah, are? First of all, there's five of the chapters that describe the five stages of the growth. Um, uh, you know, so um, I would, uh, here I can, I can just pop it up on the, my screen here. Just hold on a second. I've got the mindset uh, scorecard here. And uh, the, um, uh, the uh, introduction, the chapter is only capitalism can be measured. And this is, this is very, very crucial to the old thesis of the book is that capitalism works because every stage of its growth involves more and more precise measurements. Uh, and so it's, it's, these, are not, um, these are not abstractions. And then I have the first chapter is capitalism's five measurements. And the five measurements are, um, there's five Ps. So I'll just tell you what the five Ps are and then I'll explain what the five Ps are pricing, property, productivity, profitability, and prosperity. Okay. And, and the first thing you have to do to become a capitalist is to price your capability. So you have to have an appreciation of who, who you are as an individual and you have to price it. In other words, that you have to say, my time is worth this much, my talents are worth this much. And that's, that's the starting point. Uh, and um, you don't do this in comparison with what other people are making. 
you do it purely uh, between you and someone in the marketplace who would pay you for your time and would pay you for your capability. Okay, so that's the first one. The second one is owning your property. And I have a very expansive attitude towards property, okay? And, and you know that from um, the free zone that uh, a lot of the property is um, your unique take on the world that other people find very, very valuable. So for example, your use of the Baja community that you're creating down there, that's partially uh, a leisure experience for you because you and Vivian really love it there and everything. But your real intent is actually to create an entrepreneurial community there. And also that certain types of entrepreneurial discussions and op- entrepreneurial productions can actually happen in the growing capability. Well, that the property is, you know, the physical property, but it's actually the conceptual property. It's the intentional property that you're creating. It's like your three day turn your turn your, you know, uh, create your new future in three days. That's a property. Uh, yep. The way you go, everything that you've packed into the three days that packages someone's loose thoughts, gets them organized, gets them focused, uh, gets them totally committed, gets them totally um, clear, and then you give them the actual marketing tools to present their new um, their new future to the world. Okay, yes. so that that would all that would be included. It's that it's your impact on the world is part of your property. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then number three is improving your productivity. So you've got your pricing model and you've got your property. And now the question is, can you do uh, what you do best? Can you do it faster? Can you do it easier? Uh, can you do it at less cost? Can you produce a bigger result with it? And then you increase your profitability that more and more what you're taking in is uh, greater and greater than what you're actually spending to actually uh, do your, uh, you know, do your thing in the marketplace. And then the next thing is expanding your prosperity by linking up with other like-minded people who are doing the same thing. And together you create even bigger value creation proposition. That would be collaboration, the free zone collaboration. That's right. So that's, that's the growth path. And if you take any entrepreneur, let's say, who would come to you, you can easily take them through these five stages and they could write their entire history based on how they first priced themselves, how their property developed, how their productivity developed, their profitability, such that they're ready for the next step, you know, and, um, and it all creates prosperity. So the, uh, it isn't just you making a ton of money at the expense of the marketplace at the expense of the, uh, you know, the greater community that you're living in, but you're actually, you're, you're actually taking the whole community to a higher value. And, um, and this is an endlessly better growth system. And the reason, uh, why the, just to use a, uh, a Dean Jackson distinction here, uh, uh, the other, uh, the other, um, ideologies, they're trying to make a convincing argument, but capitalism itself is just a compelling offer. It's not a, it's not a convincing argument. It's a compelling offer. And the, the thing is that it's endlessly better growth, uh, just endlessly better growth. That's the compelling offer. Would you like to be in a methodology that get, just gives you endlessly better growth and it's systematic? And then my eighth uh, the eighth chapter is everything else falls apart. And I just go through that none of the other thought systems, the ideologies, um, um, reward unique individualism. And th- there's no measurement in these other systems of whether you're doing better. It's someone else's opinion or someone else's favor. But capitalism is strictly about um, exceeding your previous measurements. Yes. Yeah. And that, 
And then the, uh, just have to go back here because I have it. There's only eight boxes on the mindset scorecard. So I have to go back to my, and then, um, uh, what I do is I go back to the conclusion and I, and I said, if you've been, if you've read to the book and you're reading at this point, when we get to the conclusion, it means that you're a capitalist. And what you've just gotten is a framework for understanding how you've become a capitalist and prove to yourself that you've always been capitalizing. You've always been capitalizing on what was available to you. And then we have the program, uh, Coach, where entrepreneurs endlessly grow. So then I link up strategic coach with capitalism. That's the basic thesis here. Cool. That's it. I love it. I, I, um, as I listen, my thought, which I've basically said, but I'm going to say it in, in the shortest time possible, which is I think this could be an incredible introduction to young people. You remember how Apple became Apple is they put Apple computers into grade schools in junior high schools. And then what did people want to use when they got out? They Apple. Long game. It was you never you never see a Windows computer in a movie, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. So, yeah. You know, I mean, product placement. I said, uh, you know, I mean, they could put a Dell. They could put, you know, they could put, um, you know, Samsung. They could or whatever the thing. They don't. They put a uh, Apple computer because, um, first of all, everybody's got an iPhone, and that's Apple, and you know, and you know uh, everything. Yeah, well, it's it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting thing. I think it links up nice with um, um, uh, you know um, the gravy stack. What they're doing with gravy stack, yeah. Mm-hmm. But that that's more gamifying, you know, very very practical things. But there isn't an overall philosophy of of what it is, and um, you know, and it's a nice collaboration, but. Um, what what I'm thinking with this one is that um, where we give every everybody in coach, we give everybody in coach, you know, a, a copy. I think we'll give everybody in coach ten copies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think own if you own right when you own the language, you own their minds. Yeah, when you when you name the game, you own the game. Yep. And that's, um, and right now we have an enormous amount of misinformation about capitalism. And, you know, every few generations get frustrated because it doesn't look like there's anything left for me and there's no place for me. So you're like, screw it, let's just burn everything down. And, uh, and revolutions led by ignorance, um, by young ignorance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, think yeah. about yeah. it. I mean, I mean uh, <laughs> not it. Gonna, yeah, you know, it's not forty-year-olds uh, don't start revolutions. <laughs> yeah, well, it's uh, it's what happened in China over the last month. You know, yeah, you know, they were locked down, and then people burned to death because they couldn't get out because their buildings were locked and. Plus, the goodies aren't coming anymore. the the only the, the only deal that the Communist Party of China had was, um, if you give up thinking about politics, we'll make sure that you have economic goodies. Mm-hmm. Well, once the economic goodies uh, stop coming, and they're coming, uh, they destroyed their high tech industry over the last two months or over the last two years because guys like. Um, Jack Ma were getting too big for their britches, and they were starting to, they were starting to talk politically. You know, no, 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 you can't talk politics. You know, and yep. uh, and so they have twenty percent of their young people unemployed. Yeah, yeah. There's, um, and I think China found out how dangerous rich capitalists are, um, for sure. So yeah. it's, uh, well, I think. And and uh, <laughs> it's so funny because um, in Russia, twenty oligarchs have died under mysterious circumstances over the, since February. <laughs> Every windows, yeah, yeah. Stay away from windows for God's sake. 
don't 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 go to any second floor. You know, always stay on the ground floor. <laughs> that fenestration is that what they call it? Defenestration, yeah, yeah, yeah. defenestration. It's an it's an interesting. Um, um, it, it's uh, it's it's a it's an interesting term for murder. Yeah, death by de- de- uh, the act of throwing someone out of a window is the uh, formal humor- humorous and. Uh, uh great it's a great uh well it's it's funny it's uh sh- is it schadenfreude is that what it is it's 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 that kind of funny that's well, what schadenfreude you- is uh, enjoyment of other people's misery right well yeah. that's part of the thing that i can't help but have a little of when i hear um about russia in particular you're like yeah mm-hmm. well, yeah well this did this is gonna. This is gonna. As Warren Buffett would say, this will. Uh, this will end badly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was talking about cryptocurrency. He said, "I don't understand it." He said, "I don't understand it. I can't see where any value is created." And he said, "I think it's going to end badly." Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Well, and Munger says even worse things about it. Yeah, so. You're trading farts. Yeah. <laughs> trading turds. You're trading turds. <laughs> yeah, he says your neighbors are getting rich, and you ask why you're getting rich. He said we're trading turds. Well, I don't want to be left behind. I'm going to trade turds too. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. All right. Well, okay. So that's uh, that was just um, that was just it. Uh, you know. So I this is a book that's been on my mind since um, 1971. And it was when I wrote my senior thesis at the college I graduated from, and it was on the uh, Wealth of Nations uh, by Adam Smith. And um, Adam Smith, um, 1776, very interesting year. Most people think, if you're American, you think of the Declaration of Independence, and that's one of the three most important factors about uh, 1776. But... In March of 1776, a Scot by the name of James Cook produced the first steam engine that produced 25% more energy than it consumed. Mm -hmm. And that's the start of modern industrial capitalism, is that when you have a self-made, you have an innovation that has a 25% multiplier factor, um, you, you're into a different world. And then in, uh, that was in March of 1776, and I think in June, The Wealth of Nations was written another Scot, uh, Adam Smith, who was a philosopher, of, he was a professor of moral philosophy. Okay. Yep. There was no such thing as an economist in those days. And he said, you know, the secret to this new way of doing things is the division of labor. Have one person doing one thing that they master and have 25 of them doing different things and put it all together. So it's the the first real description of the assembly line. Yes. And then he said, then, then countries themselves shouldn't try to do everything. They should do what they're really great at and trade with other countries who are really great at something else. It's mm-hmm. called theory of com- comparative advantage. So, uh, and then you have the Declaration of Independence, and that's the trifecta. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, the U.S. was, the colonies were just ready for these new things. Right. Yeah. I, um, well, I, here's what, as I look through my notes right now, and I think about this, Dan, Here's at least a challenge to consider. Roll around in, in the back of your head, which is when you look at your mainstream books that you've worked on with Ben Hardy, um, I think this one could become a mainstream book because each one of your big mainstreams, like Who Not How and The Gap and the Gain, started out as skinny little quarterly books. It started off as just a concept in the workshop. Yeah. And I think this, this could have enough impact because... Uh, with young people as well as people who are confused. And um, 
uh, and, and one of one of his phrases uh, that Richard Mayberry has one of his books is "Are you Democrat, Republican, or confused?" Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, and he also has a lot of uh, material about libertarianism, mm-hmm. and what I would consider is the not moronic version of that um, that um, that's of a party, but a, a mindset. Yeah. Well, libertarianism is, uh, from what I've seen, it is pretty reactionary. You know, it's um, uh, we're not that, and we're not that. But yeah, but uh, you know, what are you? You know, and um, the the only problem with them that I get the picture of the main um, libertarian is that they live in a fortress and they have fifty rounds of ammunition mm-hmm. stored up. You know, and they're you know, and everything like that. And I've always felt that they, um, um, uh, it would be hard to have a party, libertarian party, because five of them wouldn't like being in the same elevator with each other. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they're they're very much like uh, uh, what Mark Twain would say, you know, I don't want to belong to anything that would accept me. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, that's uh, Groucho Marx, actually. Oh, it's Groucho Marx. Okay. All right. I don't know yeah. why I have. Yeah, I wouldn't go into any club that would have me as a member. Yeah. <laughs> but I, um, but they are, and you're right about, um, I got a, a good buddy who's quite the gun gun fan, and he says, yeah, well, there's a certain point where lead is a lot more valuable than gold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Pretty well, You know, I mean, uh, but... You can do that in the states. I mean, everybody can create their own church in the states. You know, yeah, yeah. Something like every month, I think there's about twenty uh, new uh, organizations that get their uh, religious tax break. Yep. They 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 submit and say, "I want to have a religion," and they've got a check box. And if you check all the boxes, and you got you got yourself a place and you got chairs and you can put butts in the seats. You got yourself a religion. And that's how, that's how the United States solved the religious war problem. They yeah. just turned it into an entrepreneurial activity. Yep. I, I mean, can, yeah. I mean, if you, if you had a little bit too much tequila, uh, down in your compound on Baya, you might think that you have some religion, uh, something religious going there. Yeah, yeah, enough tequila. That it does that. It does that to <laughs> the Holy Spirit in one form. Let me cross over to. Um, I don't remember what happened last night. You know, you had a religious experience. Yeah, you know, you had an evang- evangelical experience. <laughs> oh, yeah, new form of manna from heaven. Yeah, yeah. Well, is, well uh, thanks for this, uh, uh, Gibbs. Uh, first of all, it's uh, important feedback to me, and. Uh, but it uh, it's uh, it's a very surprising book because no one zeroes in on the unique individualism as the starting point. Yep. And um, you know uh, because once you get into uh, that, our ideology is better than your ideology. Then you're you're dead in the water. Right. You're dead in the water. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think this is definitely something where you could lead people down a, a logical path because ultimately no one likes the idea of stuff being stolen from them. Yeah. And, um, and also you don't want to be stuck with a lowest common denominator who refuses to work or create effort and expects to be rewarded just like the most productive members. Yeah. You can always deconstruct this and, and you know, we're um, capitalism, cap- what, where people believe that capitalism fails have has nothing to do with true capitalism. Well, uh, first of all, they have no experience of being capitalists, so how would they know? You yeah. know, I mean, if if you're thinking that things are supposed to be given to you, and they haven't been provided to you, and that that's a failure of capitalism, um, um, you're you're thinking wrongly. Yeah, 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 and I think that the um, um, yeah, I mean, uh, there's the thing about capitalism that it can finance its greatest enemies. Mm-hmm. There's so much wealth in, generated by capitalism that it can completely fund the people who hate it, you know. 
Yeah, that's why I always, if you really take a look at it and look at the tech barons of the last 20 or 30 years and take a look at either their former wives or you take a look at their children and grandchildren, I bet the most of the money going into anti-capitalism movements in the United States is coming from fortunes that were created by great entrepreneurs. Yeah, and I, I, uh, I want to hold a little of this back for our next episode because I've got a couple specific things that I want to uh, dig into um, that we're going to do in our, in our upcoming one. So I like where you're heading. Yeah. I think we're going to have a lot of fun in the next one. So why don't we wrap this one up? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so I want to thank you for one thing, um, which, as I said, this feels like mainstream and it talks to a younger audience. And I think more young people need um, your understanding of capitalism, history, and um, the strategic coach free zone mindset. I really do think we're at an inflection point. Yep. And um, our schools and edu our educational institutions need this kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. So um, let's continue to explore that because because I, I I really I'd love to see a deeper going even deeper than what you did today. Okay, um, I'm totally up to it, and I deeply appreciate your insights on this because we just got finished. I mean, it was two uh, two hours ago. I um, you know. And I'm interviewed, so I have, you know, I've got outlines in a thing called the Fast Filter. And Shannon Wallers, who's one of the really, truly great interviewers, she interviews me. And uh, anything that she doesn't understand, she says, well, can you explain that? Can you give an example of that? And that all gets recorded and transcribed. And then the outline plus the transcription goes to the writer and editor. And they, um, they, they're off and running with it. So, yeah. Love it. Well, great job. I can't wait to read the real book, but this was uh, a good um, good uh, whistle letter. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening. Make sure you give us some feedback and let uh, Dan know. Head over to Capability Amplifier or uh, post a comment. If you're uh, in favor of and like the idea of uh, a mainstream version of this book, book and uh, you'd like a copy for your kids as well. All right. That's it. Thank you.